Hey. Jesus Christ. All right. Um, can I, I don't know who's leafleting, but there's plenty in there. Okay. All right, come for, come, gather in. Good morning, class. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I got here so early. Well, by so early, I mean I actually got here a little bit early that I then thought I had about an hour or something and had about 25 minutes. I'm just going to give you a, a warning. Um, there is a trans activist, a particularly horrible, um, litigious, report you to the police trans activist who ironically is is a not a very nice man um and what he'll do he will um try and provoke you into touching him so he might stand a bit too close and then once you put your hand up even to defend yourself uh he'll be accusing you of assault so uh, can i just say trans activists rely on your response when they're idiots uh you just can't give them any response you won't win uh, any interaction is exactly what they want uh, so like any narcissist or crazy person you encounter on twitter uh, the rule of grey rock stands which is you just ignore them completely they get really ra enraged and angry and then they move on to their next victim so just and it's so much fun um, to not give them any power whatsoever and to just sit back. So the dangerous man might be wearing, say, a check shirt, for example. He might be doing that. He might have somebody that he pretends is his boyfriend with him. He might be, you know, walking past at any moment. <laughs> I know. Uh, OK. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, anyway, the, the way we start this is we say, um, what a day this has been, what a rare mood I'm in, why it's almost like being a... Oh, yay! <laughs> Mr. Menno arrived for the song. Mr. Menno, you arrived just in time. We were singing as you approached. Um, okay, so we are gathered here today um, because, can I just ask, who's here for the first time? Ooh. Well done. Well done. Um, who's here for the billionth time and forgot their gloves? Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> it's actually so much colder than I anticipated. Uh, but look, we're all here. Oh no, no, I'm good, I'm good. No, I've um, I'm never gonna get I'm never gonna get my old lady hands if I keep them warm. Um, so we're here because many of us I've been shouting for a really long time, sometimes at great cost. Um, and I was quite cross yesterday because I recalled the fact that it's a year ago since I was in New Zealand. And I was in favor for about oh, 35 minutes after that. People thought what I was doing was valuable. You just have to get a mob. Uh, they have to hate you a lot. And uh, uh, apparently that makes you some sort of uh, wonderful person who you, you've always agreed with all along. Um, and so I was just reflecting on those women in New Zealand because they haven't been able to speak at all, like many of you. Uh, there's, it's so much worse in New Zealand. I think there is a real overlap between draconian lockdown and how, um, how much people were locked inside their homes and trans activism. And I guess it all comes down to compliance and what you can make people do. I think that is the overlap. And in New Zealand, it was pretty horrendous. Uh, they can't talk about anything. Uh, the Maori um, leadership, who you would anticipate would really understand this, apparently don't. There's a little bit of money in, in that sort of community as well, uh, being fed to, by the government. And then you've got a really, really mad media. Um, but I'm pleased to say many of them are closing down. So. Uh, yay. Um, and they forgot to be journalists anyway. Uh, maybe they should be paid more. Uh, but I digress. 
So I was reflecting on that and how those women, despite knowing that mob, as they walked into that park that day, just like me, they knew the mob were all there with signs that we were all Nazis and really sort of quite an angry, aggressive, ready for a fight mob. Um, but they had rainbows on, so uh, it's totally different. Um, and they went in anyway because those women felt it was absolutely essential to say the words that need to be said, that if we don't keep saying them, they become unsaid and unsayable. And so I was, I don't know, a little bit tetchy about the conference that went on yesterday, which included the idea that if you're cautious, it might be all right to experiment on 16 year olds with cross sex hormones. And these people are on our side. And I'm like, what more do we need to do until these people catch up? Like they're the ones with their silence and their politeness and the professional class over the years that have turned a blind eye while their colleagues and their unions and the people that employ them just go like hellfire with this insanity. We all celebrated, probably far too prematurely, uh, the stopping of puberty blockers um, for under 16s. But what they're doing instead is they're saying, hey kids, have a countdown until you're 16, and then you can go on cross-sex hormones really quickly, faster than ever before. And whilst we're at it, we're gonna build a ward at the Chelsea and Westminster where we can shove through about 200 women every year and pretend to give them a fake penis. So we can, we can celebrate these victories, but I'm telling you, it's lip service, it's bullshit, and it's just so the Conservatives have some remote chance of being elected again, which they won't, and Labour's gonna be worse anyway. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm guessing that's why you're gathered. Um, but when it comes to those doctors yesterday, it just annoys me that there are so many of you probably here and across the country and in fact across the world of women who've lost their jobs for speaking up and saying no, um, who, who can't afford a tribunal. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I can't, I don't have a tribunal, I'm not employed. But um, most people I know couldn't afford the three months out of work to go to a tribunal. Now that doesn't mean that I don't think the tribunals that have been four and one aren't of value. I'm just saying it's not necessarily something that many of us could access. And so it doesn't work for many of us. It doesn't, it doesn't trickle down, if you like, um, because a woman working stacking shelves in Tesco's probably can't say that she doesn't want uh, Dave in the women's toilets with her without then losing her job or maybe not being quite so flexible with her hours. So anyway, so it really annoys me that this professional class just use words like gender identity and gender and as if trans is actually a thing. And so I just, I, I'm just saying that if your whole organisation is set up upon the premise that gender identity and trauma about your genitals is somehow different to trauma about going outside if you're agoraphobic or trauma about thinking you're fat if you're not, uh, or any other trauma related responses, then I think we are in trouble. Because then what we do is we say, no, that is, oh, your daughter's got gender dysphoria. Oh, well, here's this model of care. Not, oh, your daughter has had a trauma response to something. Let's find where that trauma is and let's unravel it and let's resolve it so she doesn't have these responses. Because actually we might fix this little, what you're calling gender nonsense and then maybe she'll have some anorexia or maybe she'll have something else or maybe she'll find some other coping mechanism where she pretends that this layer of identity that she builds around herself will protect the person that's absolutely trauma traumatized inside i don't say that as a therapist i just say that as doesn't that make sense um anyway so there's my there's my run i will have quite a few more but we are here so that you can speak um, because often it will be your words that have the capacity that my shrill, overtired vocal cords uh, may not reach. So if you would like to speak, uh, please raise your hand. Come on. Yes. Well done. Lily, I completely
with oh, good. About <laughs> trauma, and that how, as a psychologist, I know, and tomorrow she'll know. You need to explore what's going on when someone's traumatized. But that's not a. I've got a very quick story. Where do I look? <laughs> this one. This. Right. Okay. Very quick story that I only told my family and Homo Littlest on Twitter. And if you're not following Homo Littlest, and I won't use his name because he doesn't use it on Twitter, you gotta follow him. He's one of our fantastic allies. Okay, a number of months ago, I'd been on a jog in my local park, started to rain, so I headed home. My home is on a long, quiet street. I get into my street, and about, I don't know, 100 meters ahead of me, I see six foot, six foot two, quite stocky man, big thick calves. I can see his calves because he has a skirt and a blouse on. Okay, so I'm just thinking, well, okay, I've clocked him. I'm not scared, it's broad daylight. Doing my little run, it started to rain, so I'm being a bit careful with my footsteps. As he comes to pass me, this totally exemplifies the self-centered egotistical natures of these men. It was like out of a horror film. He reeled up and went, oh, to scare me. And I went, ah, and I started running. And I, and I looked back and said, for Christ's sake, what was that? He obviously knew I was a woman. I'd clocked he was a man, even though I wasn't staring at him. It only, it only takes you two seconds to clock these guys. And he decided to try and scare me. So I didn't go into my home, which was only about three doors along the road. I ran all the way down the road, looked back to see that he had left, and he had left my road. But when I told my family this, and home a littlest, I said, no one's going to believe me that this happened. And I said, I'm not going to post it on X. And then I thought, screw that, it happened. It exemplifies what these men are like. Just want to terrify you. Think about running into him late night in, the, in a nightclub toilet. What's he going to do then? If broad daylight, he'll reel, reel over you like a horror story. So that's my anecdote, just to exemplify what these men can be like. <laughs> Sorry, I should have said I was, my name. <laughs> you're, 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 you're oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I always forget about that. Um, I posted something on Twitter, and I'm, I'm sure many of us have seen it, of a girl walking, and there's a man following her. And can I just have a show of hands? How many women have had it where a man gives you unwanted attention and you feel quite vulnerable and you try and placate and be friendly? Nice. Uh, how many of you would have t instantly told him to fuck off? <laughs> would you? Okay, so just for the cameras, <laughs> just for people watching, most women put their hands up that that's happened to them. And I think, I don't think men quite understand the dynamic of that situation where you're somewhere, I've been on a train before and a man will come, a man came and sat with me and it's only because there were really decent men in the carriage that I managed to get away from him because other decent men came and sat opposite me to encourage that, to show that man that nobody was gonna put up with it. But I was like penned in because he came and sat on the train and I was on a table. So I was penned in and he was just, you know, he just wouldn't leave and you do the, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, um, and you just make something up. But that's what happened to this girl. She's walking along and he's like, oh, are you walking, in, why are you walking in a park on your own? Where are your friends? Where are you going? Um, and then sort of uh, asks her for a hug, says that he's gonna walk her to a car. And, and I, I guess this is, this is what the whole trans movement men in your spaces, this is exactly the dynamic between men and women that they rely on. That actually, when you're a woman in that space, in a, say you're in a, a toilet and it's just another bloke in there in a dress and you feel afraid, they rely on you to be polite. I think it's in The Gift of Fear. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, and in The Gift of Fear, it talks about, they might ask you if you want help with your shopping so they can actually get into your house. And this isn't like men in dresses, this is just men generally, whatever they're wearing. Uh, trousers or a skirt. Um, but they rely on your politeness and that's the social convention of politeness and kindness 
that we're all told if we're good women that we are polite and kind. But that's what is being exploited here by people who want to come into our spaces. We're not supposed to say, but Dave, you, you just look like a bloke and you're making everyone else afraid. Could you just stay out of the spaces? We're apparently not supposed to say that anymore. We're not supposed to laugh at the way these men look. When actually the worst thing you can look as a woman, apparently, is manly. Like, if somebody wants to criticise the way a woman looks, she's manly. But actually, be a man. You can't say he's manly. Um, well, you can, and you must. OK, who else would like to speak? Yes. Taking freezing, isn't it? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm married. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I did. I had no intention of doing this, so I'm really nervous. So give me a break. Um, when I was a teenager, this is a sort of. It won't be a shaggy dog story. I promise. I'll try and keep short. When I was a teenager, my two sisters and I and my family emigrated to Canada. Um, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> two of my sisters. Two of my sisters stayed. One stayed, married a Canadian, and emigrated. The other sister stayed, married a Canadian, and stayed. I escaped. <laughs> Thank God, that was a very long time ago. The sister who stayed married a lovely guy, very tall and handsome, and he became a member of the RNCP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And he had a very successful career. They had three children. He was promoted and they went to live in Vancouver, where they were for five years, at which time after 30 something years of marriage, he came out as, guess what? Does anyone know? Yes, big six foot tall, you know, big guy like that. Suddenly, just before his eldest daughter was about to get married. Three months before she was about to get married. And I, I wish I could say something funny because everyone who comes here and talks has got, manages to bring humor into this, but I've lost my fucking sense of humor with this. My sister is devastated. Her family is destroyed. And, um, sorry. <sighs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do this. Um, and all I wanted to say is that these fucking men are fetishes. And we have got to stand up and say that this is a fetish. And it's all about them getting a little weeny stiffy out of making us afraid. And I saw last night, after I watched Kelly on that rant, which I was just cheering in my bedroom when I watched that. I'm sorry, I'm going to take these off because I want to see you and I want you guys to see me and see these fucking tears. I know that you all know what it feels like. Some advertising campaign in the Netherlands recently has used a young woman with her tits cut off. And I will say it like that because that's what it is. It's raw and it's vile. And they're using her to advertise some men's clothing. And this is because, I don't know, Kelly, they want to, to get rid of us so that they can be us. So get all of us to mutilate ourselves and mutilate our children so that they can be the women. And I'm sorry, it's not very funny, is it? But I mean, you kind of have to laugh. Anyway, that's all I want to say. I'm putting my glasses on again now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. I know. Sorry, I didn't mean to. You know, it's, it's absolutely fine. Um, uh, so we probably know um, a trans widow or two, unfortunately, because it'd be nice if they didn't exist. But we know a trans widow or two. And let me just tell you how it goes. I was recently approached by a woman, it was about two years ago, by a woman at a party. And she said, well, you're into that gender stuff, aren't you? And I said, um, well, I don't actually use that word, but for the sake of the conversation, yes. And she said, um, oh, my husband started wearing um, nail varnish and a bit of eyeliner. And I just said, oh, um, you should leave him. And she said, oh, no, he's just, you know, he sort of says stuff like gender fluid. And I went, yeah, you should absolutely leave him. And you should leave him especially because the only reason you live in this lovely house is because your first husband uh, sadly died of cancer. And this guy's come in with your two young daughters and um, he's just bringing his whole self. And I said, and this is the start because this is, this is the same as any other abuse cycle. This is the start. I'll just wear a bit of nail varnish in the house. Just in the house. It's just fun. It's just in the house. Oh, well, just a little bit of eyeliner. Like, just between us, it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's just fun. You wear makeup. I'll wear makeup. Oh, I'm just going to grow my hair. 
No, like loads of men, have, I'm just going to grow my hair a little bit. I'm just sometimes going to wear your knickers. It's fine, it's fine. I'll never do, I'll never embarrass you in front of our friends. It's just between us. No, she says, every time, no, she says. And she gets convinced and he does it anyway. And then the next minute, he's out. And he's wearing just a little bit of eyeliner and a little bit of mascara. And then she finds his collection of photographs in which he has uploaded to somewhere of her in her, of him in her underwear. Right? That's the cycle. That's the escalation. There is nowhere for that to go but worse and worse and worse. So I'm just telling you, if any of your friends say, oh, my husband, my husband, my boyfriend, he just sometimes, you know, it doesn't mean anything. He just, it's a bit of fun. It's not fucking fun for men to wear our skin. It's not fun to be in a relationship where someone defrauds you by not telling you that they're a raging, fetishy pervert and then just launches it on you, often when you're pregnant, when you first got married, or in this case, when your daughters are getting married, and I think almost the worst of all, when their daughters start going through puberty because the insane jealousy just rises and they can't contain it anymore. They want a little bit of that puberty action for themselves where they have their own teenage girlhood um, and they live as girls, not, not women. Not, they're not cleaning for fuck's sake. <laughs> they're not doing, they're not picking up the kids when the kids are sick and the school phones, no. They're doing the fun stuff. They're doing the masturbation. Because we know, as women, as soon as I put my bra on in the morning, I can barely contain myself. It's a wonder I ever leave the house. Um, and as for lesbians, I don't even have a check shirt because I don't think I could cope. Um, I've heard for lesbians, it's difficult to actually manage their day um, with shaky legs. Um, Oh, sorry. Well done. Well done, all of you. Um, anyway, a little inside joke. It's a bit nasty, but there you go. Has to be said. Um, so I just wanted, just on that, lesbians and women and being aroused, I don't think some men understand, and I think some women actually, are so persuaded that male sexuality is sexuality, and what we have is some sort of accompanying role some sort of support act to men's sexuality, that women forget that our sexuality is pretty fucking wonderful. Um, and I think we aren't men. We don't have AGP. We aren't sexually aroused by ourselves. We don't get sex turned on. Now, when we wear nice clothes, we might know that we have become more sexually attractive and more attractive to our partner. That doesn't mean that we are turned on by ourselves. It's quite simple. You don't need to be a fucking therapist to work it out. It's really simple. That's why when somebody goes on, um, oh, that guy that goes on GB News with blonde hair, uh, who says that what about, if anybody ever asks me again, what about lesbians? Are you getting dressed in front of lesbians? Yeah. They're fucking women. Do you, hello? They are actually women. It's not the same. It's like, nobody says to men, oh, you're going to change it. You get undressed in front of gay men. Yes, because they're men. Because we've all removed ourselves from this idea that being same-sex attracted means you fancy every fucking person of the same sex. Anyway, okay, who else would like to speak? <laughs> yes. So I'm feeling quite ranty the last couple of days. Ooh, nice! Well, I am I'm wearing very nice underwear, Mary. Hello, everybody uh, on Radical Cartoons. Some of you know me. I'm not on Twitter, but I am on Spinster Getter. I've got Substack, YouTube, so look me up. Um, I hope the camera... I don't know if the camera can pick up my Kelly J. Keen laces. I highly recommend everybody to buy a pair of these. Wear them out to the shops. People don't know it's your laces, and it gives you a great feeling of confidence. Oh, you're, you know, I'm not wearing something like a lanyard or a scarf that's so noticeable, but my laces. Uh, you walk past them before oh, they would even know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, 
all jokes aside, um, a lady earlier on was telling um, <coughs> a horror story that happened to her <coughs> when she was out alone. Um, I want to um, tell you another one, and this is uh, exactly why we uh, self-exclude from places we're familiar with, places we, we used to enjoy going. Now, when I was in Bath the other day, uh, I met the real hate monster, um, the guy who's beside, behind the Twitter account because he lives in Bath, as some of you probably know. Um, and we had, uh, we had coffee at lunch, lunchtime. This is not a regular thing, by the way. <laughs> this was the first time I've met him for lunch. And, <laughs> and, I, was, <laughs> and I was telling him about um, a, a place near Bath that I used to love going to and what happened to me and why I no longer do it. Now, I started doing long walks from my house and one of the places I do is the Bath to Bradford on Avon uh, uh, towpath, which some of you might know along the canal. Uh, I think the whole length is about 10 miles. It's a lovely walk and there's cafes and there's plenty of people about. It's a beautiful walk. So I was on a very des uh, like a deserted part of this uh, towpath and there are people living in houseboats dotted along the canal. And uh, this one houseboat had um, like um, stuff outside made by an artist. Well, obviously I'm an artist, so I was really interested. And I thought, oh, somebody's selling their artwork or something, you know, I'll stop and have a look. And uh, it looked really, really nice, you know, cards and a calendar and that, you know, and this was before Christmas, so I thought, oh, maybe something like this would be, be good for a Christmas present. And um, I was picking up and looking at them, and inside the houseboat there was this sort of movement, which I can only describe as um, shifty movement. And this person came out, um, who claimed to be the artist, and... I was in that situation you're in where you don't quite know, you know, is this some um, very old weird dressing lady who happens to live on a houseboat? And um, I did actually buy one of these little calendars and I, I tell you what, I got away from there as fast as I could because I only, there was nobody about, you know, there was literally nobody about, nobody had passed me while this was going on. And I cannot describe to you the, the feeling of fear. Now, I am not usually like that. I consider myself quite a bolshy person. I wear all the, the kit out in public, you know. That doesn't bother me, you know. I can get into... This, this bloke gave off an atmosphere of um, threat. Um, and it was very, very almost sinister, the way he's almost like waylaying passers-by with, with this stuff, you know. Um, uh, now... <laughs> Afterwards, I talked about it on um, feminist social media, Spinster, and other people looked up this guy for me, looked into his background. And he is a well-known, uh, originally a transvestite, who used to be in the Royal Navy, based in Bristol area, who now lives on a houseboat pretending to be an old lady artist, and literally has on his Facebook as if he's an old lady artist. So he's taking the place of, of another woman artist and, and appropriating everything, you know? And it was, it really got me thinking because the sense of fear I had because there was nobody else about. Um, and when we looked into his background, this bloke is actually not a nice person, you know? <laughs> and so I was, I was talking to the hate monster about this. I, so I was talking to the hate monster about this and he said, oh, I love walking on the Bath and Bradford uh, topa. I said, well, you're a bloke. I said, if something like that happened to you, you wouldn't think twice about it, would you? And I, and I just want to say that even those of us who are quite out here and quite, quite standing out a lot of the time and outspoken and have, are on social media and are doing this and doing that, even we can be self-excluding. It, it will be a long time before I have the confidence to go back on that walk because he, says, he has said that he changes the location of his houseboat every two weeks because of the mooring fees. So he could be anywhere. I, I could run across him again anywhere. And I just wanted to say, you know, it happens to the best of us, you know, so, or the worst of us. Uh, the good thing about doing things in public is sometimes people just turn up uh, to have a nice time and a chat. Um, okay, um, so one of the things that we're doing, so uh, as you well know, we've started... Who? No, no, no. No, it's my sticker. It's a sarcastic, satirical, it's all right. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, so uh, what I've decided to do is this party of women. 
So this is what we're doing. It's called Party of Women. Uh, we have got loads of um, women that have emailed in to be candidates. Um, now, someone said, what's your manifesto? And I was like, it's quite short. Uh, it literally is woman, adult, human, female. So it's, I'm going to be really cringe and call it a woman manifesto. Um, or a no manifesto. Um, everywhere I go. Um, <laughs> so um, anyway, what we're doing as a as a party, what I want women to do is this is great. Head above the parapet here, great. Posting on social media, fantastic. Although please. There's some people that call that work. Please don't call it work. My work. Um, anyway, so posting on social media, great. Sharing stuff, brilliant. Um, all the other things that you're doing, amazing. Well done. But we need to go to the next level. You want to make changes? You don't want to ask the people who are having the conversations to speak on your behalf. You want to speak on your behalf. So local councils... If you look at any population who wants to change government and have power and influence in places where there is direct action and democracy, they choose local councils. So your borough council, your metropolitan councils, all of these sorts of councils where actually there's a difference between no one being in the conversation. You know when you see a policy and you're like, how did that happen? Well, nobody said no. Nobody even raised their hand and said, what about girls? What about women? Or what even about, you know, what about men and their right to privacy? Uh, what happened? What are we doing? So that's where I want us to be. So when there's a panel, and let me just say, all of the AGPs I've ever heard of who get elected in local councils, because they also poison that particular well. Then the diversity and inclusion stuff. Some person who doesn't deserve a job gets a salary for writing stupid policies that don't mean anything. And when you ring them and you go, well, what is a woman? It was someone living as a woman. OK, what does living as a woman mean? Well, you know, you know, living as a woman. I was like, that's the same word you just used. Well, you know, like, like how a woman lives. Yeah, it's still... It's still the same words, isn't it? What do you mean, living as a woman? Which we know nobody can ever answer. Um, so in those, uh, those men, they get elected. Uh, and then they also join children's committees, uh, foster care committees, um, local education authority type committees, and all the places that have impacts on policies in schools, in hospitals, uh, public access areas, so it might be your local sort of um, funded theatre, which will often have uh, grants from the local council. They might write the policies to say that if those places don't have um, trans-inclusive policies, they don't get council grants. Like the power in these places is immense. And so that's where I think we need to be. And if you want to do that, A, you need to find out when your next election is, so I think a third of the councils, which is about 11,000, a third of the councils are having elections on the, between the 2nd and the 5th of May. You need to be registered by the 6th of April. So this is not, I, I think that's quite good, because if you want to do it, you're just going to have to do it. Not, not mess around, not relax, not chill out. Uh, you need two people that can nominate you. Um, so you need two people that can nominate you who live in the actual ward where you want to be a councillor. And can I just recommend that if you and a couple of other sane women fancy doing it, can you run at the same time so you can give each other support? And then what happens, let's say you both end up on Wiltshire Council and you're in two different wards. If one of you wants to say something, the other one has to nominate to support that person speaking. 
And so that's how you do it. So try and find a running mate um, so that you can actually run together. Uh, and as many of you as possible, I'm telling you, if we get about 200 women elected out of the God knows how many places, let's say it's five, six, seven thousand places, we could just get 200 elected. Imagine the ripple effect that will have on actually people wanting to be an MP. And if you get elected as a councillor, you can also be an MP. And I don't know how the expenses work, but you get about £12,000 a year for being a councillor. Um, and if you don't get nominated to be on any committees or put on any committees, you can actually just go along to committees and you can crowbar women into any issue you damn well please. So this is, I just beg of you really, if you've ever thought maybe uh, you have to convert that very swiftly to a yes, because that is what it's going to take. And in five years time, when we look back and we're still fighting this shit, then maybe it's because you didn't stand. Maybe it's because you thought the woman next to you is going to do it. So you don't need to. The woman, oh, someone else will do it. Oh no, I'm no good at that. Have you seen the MPs? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know why anyone, after listening to Keir Starmer the other day, so Keir, what is a woman? Oh, that's a very, com you know, that's just a, you're just trying to reduce a complicated issue into, into something else. We need, we need less heat and more light. No, we need fucking fire, actually. Um, and Labour, we hope, we hope that all the political parties learn in the council elections and so on, that they cannot take your vote for granted, which they have done. They've sort of relied on the fact, and you do it as well, all of us do it, women I mean, which is why we're so screwed. We've all said, well, I care about this thing and this thing and women. Well, those two things are important. This bit, this woman thing, this thing that I am and my daughter, not, we're not, you know, we're not so important. There are people, there are people living in poverty. It's dreadful in this country. There are people living in poverty. And then what women will do, or health, health service waiting lists, women will go, well, the existential crisis facing women is not as important as that. Or it's not as important as some issue going on a thousand miles away. It's not as important as that. Or there's something else going on that's worse. So we can never put ourselves in, in first place. If we did, maybe there wouldn't be so much fucking poverty. If we put ourselves first, maybe there wouldn't be so many other things going on, although I'm quite aware of toxic empathy. I'm not saying that women are perfect, because I've met many. Um, so I'm not saying at all that women are perfect, I'm just saying that you need assertive, strong women who can actually just speak the truth and deal with things effectively. Yeah. Yes, there will be. So we're getting candidates first. Can I just ask, where is the police officer? Can we leave that man alone? He just wants attention. Yeah, I do. And that's why I'm in the middle of this circle and you're on the outside, Tarquin. Fuck off. Okay, can we just ignore him? I don't care. He's, he's a really malicious sociopath. So if we, um, he's just, a, let me just say, if, um, can I just say, if, let me just do this. Okay. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, are you ready to speak straight away? Two minutes. Damn you. Um, anyway, so what you need to do is, is register with us, go to the website. Um, you ask to be a candidate and you register. And um, 
partyofwomen.org. Thank you so much. Uh, go there and you register. And then what we'll be doing after that is um, what we'll be doing after that is asking people for support. Once we've discovered where our candidates are, we'll be um, registering. <laughs> right, let's just pretend we can't, can I just say, all he wants is attention. Um, so can we just totally grey rock this man, please? Um, okay, so then we'll be asking for help. Once we know where our candidates are, we can ask for local help. Um, but plus, it will be a really nice network of people all working for one common purpose. You have to, you have to understand this phrase and you have to believe it. No woman has a penis. No man has a vagina. Uh, there's no such thing as non-binary and transitioning children is profound abuse. Um, can I also say, it's, we are a single issue party. Some people just struggle with that idea. Single issue, right? We are just focusing on women retaining and maybe getting back some of our rights um, and also the protection of children. So that's what we want. Um, there are other issues going on in the country and what we're going to do is we're going to totally ignore the rest of them. So we're going to, uh, if people ask us about, oh, well, what about the police and policing in this area? What about crime? Well, I'd like the police to recognise what a woman is uh, so that women are not disproportionately impacted by diversity and inclusion policies and having their rights stripped away when they're in custody. Oh, well, what about the NHS? Well, I would like the NHS to save money on ensuring that when a woman goes into hospital, she feels safe and secure so she can get well better and go home quicker, which will save the NHS money. So that's what I'm talking about. Somebody said, well, there are other issues. Yes, there are, and there are other parties. Um, and Nigel Farage, like him or loathe him, he had one issue and I believe we came out of the European Union. I think it kind of works. Um, do you know what he did? He had no nuance whatsoever. No nuance, no politeness, no courtesy, no respect, none of it. He just was very direct with what he wanted and people knew what, they, what he wanted and therefore people can, actually, people can actually say, do you know what, I'm gonna go with that because I know exactly what you mean. I'm not going to go with that and go, oh, what do you mean women don't have penises? Oh, you never said. Um, so that's how clear we're going to be. You ready? You ready? Can I introduce our first party of women elected councillor? <laughs> What's your name and where'd you come from? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Okay, so my name's Mandy Clare, and the last time I spoke at one of these events, and the first time I spoke at one of these events was in Liverpool a few months ago, and I spoke about Darvo. So this well-known um, domestic abuser, male violence against women um, strategy that anybody who's worked within the field of domestic abuse knows and understands. So uh, it uh, stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. And this is what we see again and again and again, and it's narcissistic, manipulative behaviour. It's using the same techniques of gaslighting and reversing the blame. It's a mass uh, gaslighting of women who are speaking the truth and speaking from an evidence-based perspective. So as a local councillor, that's what I do within the council chamber. I speak as a woman for women, for children, for people that are same-sex attracted, um, and for freedom of speech from an evidence-based perspective. That's it. It's nothing more complicated Woo! than that. And you can do it too, so it's not rocket science. And because I've been one out of 70 councillors for quite a long time who's been the only one who's been prepared to do that, and they've voted down debate every single time, it can be isolating, but I've now got someone who will second motions. 
so I can get motions on the council agenda and that gives me two minutes to talk about that issue and put it right in everybody's face makes it really awkward for them. What makes it even more awkward is if when we have candidates for the party of women standing for election and getting elected, we have a support group around that woman who will come along to council meetings and publicly speak to support that woman um, and to support that councillor. And the difference that makes is that all of those councillors who keep their heads down and hide from this issue behind a banner, a rainbow banner, an aggressive rainbow banner of kindness and inclusion that doesn't include women and doesn't care about children, every time they do that, if members of the public turn up to council meetings in increasing numbers, it makes it really awkward for them to keep their heads down. So what we need is a massive team nationally of candidates for local councils. That's our first line of attack. You can do it. You can do it, OK? It needs to be plain speaking. It just needs to be the truth, nothing more complicated than that. We will support you. You'll have to get your own application forms. You'll have to get in touch with your um, Democratic Services officer locally and you'll have to ask them about your local process. But it's going to be very similar to the one that I went through and that I've supported other local candidates successfully to get through and get elected. So we will be alongside you. You're going to have to do some work for yourself. You're going to have to be brave. You might have to take a certain amount of flack, um, but you, are, you can do it. And we will be with you alongside you every single step of the way. You will not be alone, OK? So do it. Go for it. We're having three training sessions this week in the evening. You need to go on the Party of Women website, go to that little um, QR code thing, make sure you've joined the party, sign up, don't hide. We haven't got much time. We need to get it sorted. Thank you. Okay, my name's Diane and I've come from Manchester. I also work with domestic abuse. Um, I wasn't going to speak. I, I wasn't going to speak. Um, my name's Diane, I'm from Manchester. I also work within domestic abuse. I wasn't going to speak, I've not planned anything, but I need, I need to say I apologise to one of your stewards because I nearly sort of went for them. And it's, it, the reason being is because they had the trans flag and I thought they were just coming around um, trying to sabotage the, the uh, women speaking and uh, Kelly you asked a question um, and you asked a really important question you said how many of us have been intimidated and felt that we can't do anything when there's been a male within our spaces and we felt you know alone and everything and I put my hand up for that um, having been a victim of lots of lots of abuse and attacks from men in, in my life but having said that when Kelly then asked you know who would who would tell them to f off i put my hand up and she said really let me tell you kelly i i have been um i've got six children i've been in three domestic abuse refuges and everything that's why i do the work and i'm so passionate about the work that i do today but it's taken me i've had an attempted rape i've had um so much abuse i've got a fractured skull everything i've had so much abuse from men that now i am in that place where now i don't freeze now I don't fight, now I fight. And we have to fight. As women, we have to fight now. We really do. And so when I was here today, <laughs> and then somebody came around with a trans flag, and I thought, it was like, whoa, I'm not having that. So, but I do need to apologise to that lovely steward who was giving out, you know, the stickers. I'm so sorry. But that's where I am today. But the thing is, why should women have to have gone through so much in order to get that fight? You know, we've got to, we've got to fight. We've got to. We are, we are half the population now. Come on. I, I now want to be a councillor, I'm telling you. Um, yeah. And actually, I'm actually in the, the ward of um, Angela Rayner. Yeah. And everybody knows me in Ashton. I could beat Angela Rayner's ass. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm just... But I, we do need to fight. We do. We can't stay silent. We've got to fight. And I know that I, doing this 
I'm, I don't know if I'm on social media or anything, but I could probably lose my job over this. I don't know, but I know that there are some things that are more important. And I know that Kelly said that it was, uh, you know, some people might view it, the party of women as being a one track pony, but no, a one track pony is not the truth. The truth is more important than anything else. So thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love you to run against Angela Rayner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I must say, I did love it. It was like, what? this person here. Um, that's what we all need to do, I guess. Uh, right, who would like to speak? Yes. Hi, Sal. <laughs> Hey. Oh, you right, How are you? Good, good. Oh. Hi everyone. Um, my name's Sal and I'm from Australia. Really? Like, okay, just tell me if you can't hear me. Okay, I'll talk louder. Um, so I've come over to the UK for a week because of the censorship in Australia. So I'm being taken to court by a man named Roxy Tickle who um, wanted to get onto a female only space that I created and I kicked him out. And he is taking me to court for gender identity discrimination and Tickle v Giggle, the stupidest named court case of all time, is actually the what is a woman case. It is the case in law that addresses it in international law, Australian law, it'll help in the UK, Canada, everywhere of what is a woman and make sure that, um, that women is a category in law that men cannot um, identify into. So this guy, um, this is really relevant, I don't talk about this too much, but how he discovered me, and he admits to it, was I'd done a post on Twitter about what TRAs do to a female-only space. That's how he was introduced to me, he commented on it, and then he went on the app. And now he spent two years using the legal system to basically you know try and force me to allow him in and I'm not going to do it but I had this realization this week of like when I watched did everyone watch that video of the in Australia of the cleaning lady who the um, guy in the hostel who was going after her and it made me realize that I actually was in a position with a digital only space where I could safely like I could remove the men I had the power and in real life female only spaces we don't have that we remove ourselves so in a way i wonder if it was always going to take a digital space for it to happen because that's where we can remove them rather than removing ourselves so the case goes to um, court in two weeks there'll be a verdict by mid-year if we don't win in federal court we will take it to the high court we'll take it as far as we can possibly go to make sure that female only spaces are protected and women's rights in law are protected it's 500,000 Australian dollars and we need a lot more money. So if you can donate, go to gigglecrowdfund.com. I would rather 20,000 people donating $10 than one person giving 200,000. That's how much left we have to do. Um, because I want 20,000 people. I mean, I'd take $200,000 <laughs> from somebody. I'm not stupid, but I, yeah, but I would like I would pref I want 20,000 more people to know about it. I want 200,000 people to know about it. I think that that ultimately is more important. So thank you very much. Thank you, oh. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to tell you about the police. So over the last few years, some psychopathic baby fetishist asshole phones my house, threatens my kids, sends me messages about how they might die of cancer and how long it might take. He's been messaging me for so long, he was a little bit more um, topical because he used to talk about them dying of COVID. So um, really, really the most, the most obscene, vile messages I've ever received and phones me frequently. And by frequently, I don't mean like every week, I just mean like about 10 times. And uh, I told the police and I said, I've made a really long report, but I don't know this fucker's name, but that's him. Do you know what the police did? Cycled off. Yeah. They just fucking cycled. I'm so like, what the fuck? Just what the fuck? This prick goes, someone's arresting me. Um, and makes reports to the police and gets people in court. Apparently for the police, 
If you've got a cunt, you can't be a cunt. <laughs> it's, I'm so, I'm, I'm so sorry for anyone watching. I'm just, it just seems to me like, if you're a nasty, raging, narcissistic, psychopathic, sociopathic prick, if you're that, rejected, probably rejected by your family because they're so embarrassed, um, your mum probably just looks at you with pity and your dad no longer looks at you at all anymore. I'd imagine that's how it goes. And you're just left with a couple of friends who are a little bit interested what genitals you've got. If you're that, then you can ask the police to come to your aid and they fucking come. But if you're a woman and you're stalked or you're harassed, don't bother the police too much because they might get criminalise you. And then they will be sorry if you get killed after you've reported it repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Which is what happened to a young lady not very long ago. Mary, can I have your... On a lighter note. Okay, I want to say to... And I'm going to pronounce these wrong. Menno, you can tell me how to pronounce it right. Um, I, Aileen de Graaf and Anka Zielstra. Uh, both Dutch um, darts players. They both left the sport because Davy McDave Van Leuven um, became the World Series 2 champion. So can we have a cheer for those women who left the competition? And Katie... I don't, I, maybe it's my age, maybe it's because my grandparents love watching wrestling on a Saturday afternoon and a bit of darts, but I'm very partial to uh, feeling a bit crap on a cosy afternoon watching darts. And I've never been so excited uh, when I saw that blonde, blonde woman who was just so impressive. But to think that it's like Lynn said when we we're in Colchester, it's not even necessarily that men are better at pool, which I'm, I think they probably are, and darts. I think probably their limbs and the way their hips are and, and, the, and the free time to practice. Um, um, I'll have uh, another double gin. Um, if, if you're old enough for that comedy, then I love you very much. Um, but anyway, it's... It's not that, it, it might be the fact that their limbs are longer, it might be the proportion of everything, it might be their muscle fibres, it might be any of those things. But what Lynn said is, it's actually, it's nice to just be with women when they're taking those, when they're actually participating in those sports. It's nice just to be around women. It's nice not to have, and then I'm sure you find the same, if you're in a male only group, it's a particular sort of feel. If you're in a women only group, it's a particular sort of feel. Once you just get one member of the opposite sex, it totally changes the nature of that environment. And so then, that's what Lynn was saying. It doesn't actually matter whether they've got advantage, although they do. It just matters that women only, women's competitions should just be for women. Uh, anyway, Katie, over to you. So sorry you've got two, so sorry. Hi, I'm DJ Lippe. Um, I hope you don't mind if it might be a bit of a long one today. I'm going to read something out. Usually I just freestyle, but I've, uh, I've started a, a sub stack. So if you want to search it, it's called Lippe. And it's to push back against some of the rhetoric that's been coming around about a position that I think many of us hold in common. Um, and I think it's time that we got a little bit better at trying to articulate getting off Twitter and actually writing what it is that our disagreements are, how it is we actually see the trans movement. So this is the first piece that I want to I wanna write and hopefully bring things forward a little bit. Um, it starts, have you seen the meme on the roller coaster of the, scare, the scary skeletons and the newly, polite newly peaked people? This is a letter to a newly peaked turf. If you've just peaked, welcome. Was it Dylan Mulvaney? Or the bearded dude in the gym locker room? Was it that creep, Jeffrey March? Maybe it's closer to home. Maybe you're worried about a friend's trans-identified daughter whose mental health seems to be spiralling out of control. No matter how you came to the fight, welcome. 
it's likely you were left at who is either same sex attracted or a lifelong ally. You're shocked and disappointed in the reactions of many, including lifelong friends who you thought may have extended you a little more break, grace before cutting you out of their lives. You've probably heard from transsexuals like Buck Angel and learn there is disagreement even amongst the trans identified community. You think you've got it all figured out. The political union that will defeat the LGBTQI juggernaut. You can have your cake and eat it too. You're not hateful and you're not anti-trans. If gender criticals team up with rational trans identified folk, we can show the world the third way out of this mess. We can put a stop to child transition. We can ensure women's rights are respected and balanced with the right of genuine transsexuals. Not these Johnny come lately fakers, the trans trenders, or the rapists using it as a get out of jail free card. The actual transsexuals who go the whole way, the ones suffering crippling gender dysphoria. You're horrified to learn of a shadowy group of extremists, ultras. They're the, <laughs> They're the actual transphobes. The ones who seem to hate the gays just as much as the trans. They're the alt-right handmaidens, the trad wives who would otherwise see women barefoot and naked in the kitchen. For our shire wives, if you will. You've been warned to block them and you think you might. You've had a few run-ins with them on Twitter. They're just as bad as the TRAs trying to compel your speech and demand you use their language. They drove Andrew Doyle off Twitter, for God's sake. This is a salutary lesson in the truth of the horseshoe theory. The notion that those at the far end of the political position are a mirror of one another. They're dark and ugly shadow. Well, I have a message for you, my sweet summer child. We are you in a few years time. Uh, if you have the stomach to stick around, most of us started out in your position. Uh, <coughs> We spoke with transsexuals, invited them into our groups. We tried to support them as they set up their own advocacy organisations. Groups like Trans Rational, of trans identified males like Kinesis. We tried to work together, we really did. What we received in return was a real time lesson in the perils of forced teaming, of attempting of attempting to create a political union of groups who have diametrically opposing aims. It turns out women's rights campaigners and very sexist people don't really get along. <laughs> the ultra's position is that of the gender atheist. Gender doesn't exist, therefore trans doesn't exist. Yay. Yay. Nobody is trans, therefore the civil rights claims of trans identified individuals are null and void. We fight to legally reverse all the privileges that have been afforded to them, essentially on the basis of self-declaration. We don't want to amend the Equality Act to clarify that women are female only in certain circumstances. We don't think womanhood can be partitioned this way. Don't believe me? Ask India. <laughs> no, not that one. <laughs> we want to repeal the GRA and remove the protected characteristic of gender reassignment from the Equality Act. As long as the notion that trans exists in law, we must be eternally vigilant. An amendment by its nature can be overturned at any point. It may seem like the path of least, path of least resistance, but it's really just a loop back to square one. The civil rights of those who identify as trans could be protected by other strands of the Equality Act. Sexual orientation, sex, belief and disability. We want to severely limit, if not ban, transgender medicine. Not just for children, but for adults as well. If the WPAF files proved anything, it was that vulnerable adults can be just as much as risk from predation by this movement as vulnerable children. To learn that, cl to learn that clinicians argued patients in psychotic states could consent to castration seems to fly in the face of all medical ethics. The failure of safeguarding is systemic and medical regulators are not exempt. We have no faith in their ability to safeguard the vulnerable. Trans is
he's at the vanguard of a medical revolution which is fundamentally rewriting the social contract between clinician and patients. We are moving to a model in which the paying customer is always right, even if he identifies as both a, wo a, both a woman and Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> A ban on child transition is essentially a pause button. It will do nothing to help the thousands of young women chopping off their healthy breasts because they've been convinced they're not like other girls. Medication, sorry, neither will it dissuade Big Pharma from profiting from an industry which, in which each trans identified person is said to be worth 1.5 million over a lifetime. Furthermore, we want it to be known uh, furthermore, we want it to be known that the majority of men with a trans identity have a paraphilic disorder and are performing a dangerous fetish which is nearly always correlated with others. Paraphilic disorders like voyeurism, exhibitionism, exhibitionism and paedophilia. It's an uncomfortable truth to face. It is the truth that dare you not to speak its name. That once spoken allows us to be dismissed and confirms in the minds of the ill-informed the truth that we view the LGBT community as groomers and perverts. It's just that, in this case, these men actually are. <laughs> Literally, textbooks perverts. <laughs> it's in the DSM. Um, as long as trans exist as a legal entity, gay rights and women's rights will be forfeit. As long as the law protects men in their performance of womanhood, safeguarding will be undermined, perhaps fatally. It is also the ultra's position that language has been central to this endeavour. Pronouns are a linguistic magic trick that turn males into females. As the interim cast report notes, they are not a neutral act. They solidify trans identities in the minds of the vulnerable and workers roll hypnol, lowering women's boundaries around men who would otherwise be seen as the dangerous sexual predators they quite clearly are. If they weren't important, trans right activists wouldn't have worked so hard to create hate speech laws, which effectively criminalise those who say men aren't women. To punish those who say the emperor is naked and what's more, he seems to quite like showing us his penis. <laughs> Look, there he is, playing, it on, playing, it, playing the piano with it on Radio 4, <laughs> Channel 4. Uh, we're the veterans, those who've been involved in this movement since its inception. You might think you have peaked, but I can assure you that you haven't. It's a process, just as you think it can't get any worse, it does. We've been down so many rabbit holes at this point, we're on first name terms with Alice, the Mad Hatter, and the entire court of the Queen of Hearts. <laughs> Have you learned yet about autogynophilia? About the men who created the transgender movement? Do you yet appreciate the extent of the institutional capture? The funding that has been invested globally in this movement? The money to be made? The markets opened up? Have you learned yet about pie and the dark history of the struggle for paedoph paedophilia acceptance? What about queer theory? Transhumanism? Have you met Mika yet? <laughs> But, 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 I hear you say, I'm not a feminist, why would I adopt their position? I have my own views about the world, adherence to ideology is what got us into this mess in the first place. The truth of the matter is, the majority of the, those laid ultras are not actually feminists, let alone radical ones. Can I have a cheer if you're not a feminist? Yeah. You should question how it is that we can be compared to Mussolini by those on the left, and men hating shrews by those on the right. Might it be the case that we are being slurred left, right and centre because of our political position? Might there be a financial incentive to shut down ideas that challenge the profit margins of a mar market worth billions anyway? <laughs> I've not researched that yet, I'll put that in. <laughs> Might some sexist men be using this as an excuse to punish disobedient women and exert their dominance in what is predominantly a women's rights movement? to isolate the bad women and remove our ability to speak with those charged with our protection. Does this behaviour sound familiar? Turf. Because this isn't a reverse engineered position, it's one which many individuals have coalesced around because they believe it is the best reflection of reality and the best path out of the madhouse. 
You cannot compromise with irrationality to sit down and negotiate with the Mad Hatter and his best mate, Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> the position at heart is those who approach the issue from a safeguarding position and those who conceptualise it as a clash of rights between opposing groups of civil rights claimants. From our position, many of those who claim a trans identity are dangerous fetishes, fetishists who have been given licence by the state to force everyone to play a part in their sex lives. Is it any wonder we refuse to sit down and negotiate our rights with them? by the police. Uh, it also seems, I'm nearly finished, trust me, I know you like that now. <laughs> it also seems to be a split that has a class element. Working class women often have roles in which safeguarding is central in women's work. We wipe the bums of your babies and also your elders. Meanwhile, it's those who work in academia or media who tend to take a more moderate position. They may take passing glances at their workplace safeguarding policies, but it's unlikely to form a central pillar of their practice. They likely wouldn't risk their job or receive a custodial sentence for failure to properly understand their duties or to maintain professional boundaries. It is those at the bottom of the social hierarchy who are less likely to trust those in authority, who have been failed too many times by those who identify as their saviour. It is working people who live in a world of systemic safeguarding failures, which are putting us and our communities in danger. As a woman raised in the borough of Oldham, next door to Rochdale, I can tell you that my trust in the authorities is next to nothing. I hope I am not pr just preaching to the choir. I'm literally preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that if you disagree with me, you have at least managed to make it through to the end of this essay without throwing your phone out the window. I am sure I have strawmanned your viewpoint in an attempt to draw out some common threads between our respective positions. Thank you for sticking around. I am sorry if you feel patronised, although I'm teaching you how to suck eggs. It can feel uncomfortable to read information which challenges your worldview or sense of self. I'm sure you think of yourself as an intelligent, kind and tolerant person. I am sure that you are. It's just that I don't think you've spent enough time thinking about it. If you're a woman, you'll have uh, an impossible set of priorities and this probably isn't your main one. My concern is that your best qualities are being weaponised now just as they were when you were trans allied. Weaponised empathy so that you are inadvertently working to uphold the ideology we are all ostensibly united in fighting against. In my substack over the coming weeks and months, I will be laying out this position in greater detail, providing important context and evidence for many of the arguments laid out in this essay. It may seem unkind to be so blunt about trans-identified individuals, but this is because we live in a world where boundaries are framed as hateful and where telling the truth is becoming a revolutionary act. Or, to put it in the immortal words of Magdalene Burns, Maybe it's that we'd be, rather be rude than a fucking liar. Thank you. Uh, you, can find, you can find me on Substack, Lippy or Lippy Promotions. And if you'd subscribe, that'd be fab so I can get the word out and start to argue back. Thank you. Uh, one moment, I can never... Yes, come. There's another lady as well who wanted to speak. Oh. You're coming as a group. You're speaking. Woo! Three to fiends. Oh no, many group. Many, many, many. Hello. We're from Brighton and Sussex. And I came here on my own a few years ago. And I we're just sending hello pot come in, come in. Brighton and Sussex. Look at us. And we all started on our own. We came here on our own and we've ended up meeting once a week in Brighton and we've found our sanity, haven't we? Um, because when you're on your own, it can be really, really difficult. So we're here to say hello to Brighton and Sussex. 
Any of you in the crowd, Brighton and Sussex, come and see us after. Any of you at home, you can go on to Let Women Speak Forum, letwomenspeak.org, push the local button, and you will be able to find out where we meet. We also have a few other women in the crowd here that haven't, turned, haven't come up here. And we also have um, a gay man that visits us every week. <laughs> but he's so respectful, he doesn't think we don't like men, he just gives us our women's space. See? So here we are. That's all we're doing. We just wanted to say hello. You're not alone. Come and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I thought there was a there was a foreign there was a foreign woman. Just one moment. There was a foreign woman from Scotland. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hello. Thank you. How are you? How are you? I'm in good form. Good, You're good. looking lovely. Well, you too. <laughs> Hello, London. It's, um, it's lovely to be here. This is the first time I've been at Speaker's Corner and um, shame. <laughs> and I'm delighted. It's really exciting. I value what you do. Thank you. Um, and I'm excited that you're going to come to Edinburgh as well, some of you. So I wanted to have a quick word about the hate crime bill. <laughs> because the world has gone mad and I want you to come, but you need to be aware of what you're taking on because they are not playing a game. When the hate crime bill comes in, the problem with it is it's so badly written that the police don't really know how it's going to work. So they're going to need test cases to figure it out. So if anybody is offended by what you are wearing or holding or saying, they can report you to the police as being hateful. And the commitment from the Scottish First Minister and the Chief Constable is that they will investigate every single complaint of a hate crime. It won't be protective that you live in England and it's really important that you understand that because it appears to be the fact that if somebody wrote a tweet that I was offended by when I'm living in Edinburgh, if I report it to the police, it will be looked at as if that tweet was published in Scotland and you could be held liable and arrested. Go figure. So what I want you to think about is if you want to wear a T-shirt that says lesbians don't have penises, for instance, which some people might be offended by, then do it, but be aware that it might be a risk. Well, I think they could arrest us all. It's just like, where are they going to put us? The problem with it isn't really the arrest, I think, like from my point of view, it's that they will take your electrical equipment from you because as we know, the process is the punishment. So I'm in a number of WhatsApp groups with a number of women in them who are stealth. They're not out. So if the police got that information, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be putting those women at risk. I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to solve that issue. Burn Apart, phones. burn their phones, yeah. Or keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> That's not going to work because, because fundamentally I am, I am up for it. You know, like I'm already condemned. <laughs> You know, I'm, you know, I've upset a series of people, including our current First Minister, by having an opinion that I expressed in the public gallery, um, with considerable effect. Yeah, it did. It did work because an MSP recorded it, and like fair play to him. So the penalty for the hate crime bill is seven years in jail. They are not playing. I am quite comfortable with seven years in jail because I've got a reading list like that. And, um, you know, I'm not getting time to read. And in jail, it seems that you have to sit down for 23 hours a day. I can do this. I'm not... There's a reason I'm fat and unfit. Um, I want you all to think about your pelvic floor, though, if you come to Edinburgh, because we are going to have to yell at the patriarchy and I don't want you pissing yourself. <laughs> Because it's going to be a lot of fun. Because what the women do is they use humour as a tool and as a defence. And the police hand us gifts like the hate crime monster. It's going to be beautiful. 
So if you're interested and you're in Edinburgh on the 1st of April, Andrew Doyle's bringing Comedy Unleashed up on the day the legislation comes in place. And I've got 10 minutes. And if I don't get arrested at the end of that, then I think I've failed. Um, <laughs> it'll be fine. I am 51 years old and I did not expect to find out that I was punk in my middle age. But So I hope that you do come to Edinburgh because we want to see you and it's important. The world is watching Turf Island, so we might as well give them a show. Thank you. Anyway, I've always wanted to share a cell with a famous author or a wonderful comedian. So uh, I think we can all do that. Edinburgh is going to be fun. I've, like you said, with the humour, I think that's why I don't want to insult any other people from other countries. But I think we do have such a superb sense of humour here in the United Kingdom that that's one of the reasons we've been able to fight this quite so well because someone will, like you said about the hate bill, and we're all like, oh, okay, all right, challenge accepted. Um, and I think it's just that sort of the, the way of reversing, you know, it was, um, I'm going to praise myself, but someone chucks soup on me, I make some stickers of Campbell's soup. It's like, that's, that's what we do. I think it's a British tradition. Um, I'm sure other countries might do it. Uh, but not quite as well. And I and often you see, I think it was in many, you, uh, we had an amazing, <laughs> did you see the six foot seven and a half man with in plastic trousers uh, in Colchester? What was beautiful, there's a photo and somebody was going to send it to me and I didn't receive it. But we've got one of the ladies that comes frequently who makes the most beautiful signs. <laughs> She's about five foot one. <laughs> and she's standing there like this, with this big stop sign that says, stop pretending. <laughs> and he's just standing in front. <laughs> so just the, just the whole thing of it is just so wonderful of watching. And then, of course, that man then went in to the park and he gave us the most perfect, the most perfect photo of what this is about with two trying very hard to be different girls um, with kooky haircuts, um, about 19 or 20, spending their Saturday afternoon with two blokes in their 50s, maybe 60s, dressed as women. And we all know, and they were all dressed as like, well, one of them didn't even have matching shoes, which I... <laughs> which I thought was hysterical for someone who's really concerned about matching his identity to his inner person. Um, but he couldn't manage the shoes. Um, but these sort of are really mediocre, pathetic men who we know that those girls wouldn't even take a moment of their day to even acknowledge, let alone stand around as if they're part of some sort of community. So these like, pornif one was pornified. He had really skin tight, maroony browny plastic trousers and then a top that was supposed to look a bit lacy and he's part of out something outhouse, outhouse which is the official um grooming the official grooming center of colchester i think it's i think it's called that uh, i may have got that might be different letters than grooming but it was very similar um and so it was just it was just wonderful how they were all just stood there and um, handing out some leaflets that I'm, I'm not going to beat about the bush. They were libelous. They did say some terrible things about me that I've never heard before. Uh, so I was really, really upset. Um, I cried right into my uh, Nazi gold. Um, anyway, there was a lady who wanted to speak. I won't be long. I've got cold, so I won't be okay. okay. I'm not going to be long. Um, earlier in January, um, I spoke here, and I'm one of those ones that um, is adding to the voices of taking on queer theories. And 
underneath queer theory, it's the epicenter of it is the work of the philosopher Michel Foucault, the French philosopher. Back in January, I told the tale of how his first book, The History of Sexu Sexuality, Volume 1, is a complete fable. Um, it's full of lies. None of it happened. And yet this is the foundation of what so many people in, the, in various movements have come to believe is our actual history. My piece, Debunking Myths About Victorian Sexuality, shows how homosexuality was outlawed because it got swept up and caught up in trying to prevent children from being sexually exploited in brothels in the Victorian era. The two things were conflated at the time by Labouchere, Henry Labouchere. It's all explained. I just wanted to let you all know that I've done another piece that takes on Foucault's next two books, The History of Sexuality, Volumes 2 and 3, where I go through some of the ancient Greek stuff that he's talking about because he wasn't a great historian on that stuff either. And so it's not everybody's cup of tea, but if you are interested, please do take a look. I'm Tamara Sears UK on Twitter. Thank you. We, um, who else would like to speak? Yes. <laughs> no, I won't. We thought you said hour. I was going to be no. <laughs> it depends. What's it for? Is it competing with me in any no, way, shape, or form? It's supporting all the things you're doing. Oh yeah, then. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> um, thanks very much, uh, Kelly J. Um, I just want to give a bit of an advert for Liberal Voice for Women's next event, which is on the 15th of April, seven o'clock. It's going to be about caring about dignity. Now you, for for. Four play. <laughs> cut that, cut that bit. <laughs> you, uh, you, you uh, uh, foregrounded Theresa Steele's story, and <clears throat> also you gave a voice to her, Henrietta Freeman when she was able to complain about her uh, situation. So uh, my speaker is going to be Dr. Zoe Hollowood, friend of mine, chair of chair of Liberal Voice of Women. Uh, her conference speech last year at the Lib Dem conference has been seen, a video of it has been seen over half a million times, thanks to one of our supporters. And uh, we, she only had two minutes to try and uh, campaign for fair voting in our internal election system. But she has set up this group, uh, it's called Caring About Dignity, and I'm going to be talking to her about that, and hopefully to some of the people that she's helped, uh, she's helping with this group, uh, maybe she'll be uh, speaking with Theresa Steele, I don't know, but you're all welcome to come and join if you want to. Uh, we'll be advertising it on, on the internet, Liberal Voice for Women. And also uh, later in the summer, uh, the WI in Oxford show are going to be uh, hosting, what's your name? Elaine Miller. <laughs> and the WI in Lincolnshire are going to be hosting Elaine Miller. And I'm hoping that the WI in Berkshire are going to be hosting Elaine Miller. It's her Heart of England tour. So, you know, everybody is doing so many great things and a lot of it takes place here. Thank you, Kelly J. Thank you. It's nearly warm enough, so I thought I'd... <laughs> Bit of turf island. I have so many jumpsuits that... I've had to retire some into uh, one of those little bags that shrink wraps everything. Um, oh, I, well, when I become that global icon that I tell my kids I am, I will donate them somewhere. Uh, many of them are very cheap polyester. Uh, okay, what, what was I going to say? It was, oh, I know, I'm going to do my own advert. So, it has been said that my husband's a multi-millionaire. I, I fear that may be a husband I'm not aware of. Um, but the way this works, the way this has worked, uh, I speak to someone often who says, you literally started this from your kitchen table, which is kind of a, but I literally started this from my kitchen table. Um, in July 2018, I sold my first ever t-shirt and stickers um, because I wanted to put up a billboard 
And that really has, I've never, I've never said, oh, I'm starting something, can I? I'm starting this, can I, can I have some money? Because I always thought that the way that you cleverly do these things is by creating money, by making people want to give you money, but they get something in return. And I've always thought you get quite a good deal, actually, because you get your T-shirts, stickers, whatever. But you also know that the rest of it helps do things like this. And you know that the rest of it helps ensure that people all over the world actually get to hear about these messages and that women are liberated from their sometimes self-enforced uh, silence and self-exclusion um, and isolation. Like we heard in Colchester as a woman went to complain that there was a man in the changing rooms and now a woman in her probably late 50s, early 60s doesn't go to any keep fit classes at all anymore because she can't rely on there being any female only spaces at her gym. Um, and it often happens, a good friend of mine said, <laughs> said, oh, there's one that's come to, there's one, it's always like there's one. There's, it's not there's a man or there's a trans woman or uh, it's never any sort of language. It's there's, there's one. Um, he's just started coming, or she, they might say, just started coming to the um, Aquafit. He's just, and he does look silly, like we all feel a bit sorry for him because he looks so silly in his costume. And I'm thinking, he's not feeling sad. He's euphoric. He's masturbating himself silly when he gets home, if not whilst he's in the actual changing room. Um, He's secreting little bits of semen all over the toilets. Um, and that might sound really extreme. It's true. A little bit of seepage here, a little bit on the toilet roll, knowing that you were going to touch it. Um, there is no depth of depravity that these men won't sink. And you don't know which ones they are because they don't advertise, I'm one of the bad ones. Um, I'm, on the, I'm on the spectrum where... I wear my mum's underwear and I wear my wife's clothes when she's out, but um, I'm really, I'm okay teaching kids. I'm all right. I'm all right in front of teenage girls erasing their boundaries because I'm respectful and courteous. Um, so, you know, that's not, that's not, that wouldn't be a mechanism that groomers would use, would it? That wouldn't be a mechanism to groom anyone, would it? Just pretend to be nice, polite, charismatic, respectful, and then actually the undercurrent of that is that you're making your way. First, if you want to access children, who do you groom? Their parents, their teachers, anybody who's going to stand in their way, that's who you get first. I'm on side. And then do you know what happens? When you say something silly or when you do something terrible, you get all those people to defend you even the parents of the children that you want to access. That's how grooming works. So anyway, so that's, that's what I, the way I do this is that you fund this. We are, we are Davids or Davinas. Well, maybe not Davina. <laughs> maybe not Dave's either actually. Uh, but we are mere small people trying to fight against this extraordinary well-funded giant. And we all do it in our own way. But I can't do this. I can't do these weekends. I can't do, do any of the things that I do um, unless you help me uh, by doing something. Might be sharing, might be putting yourself forward as a candidate, uh, might be being able to support a candidate, might be putting yourself forward for MP, might be buying some stickers or merch. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna say it, it is the best merch. <laughs> um, even if you think that maybe somebody else's drawing is a little prettier, this will be the most luxurious item in your wardrobe. And I say that as somebody who hunts out a bargain in a designer shop. Um, but seriously, it's really good quality stuff and it's, it's a little bit clever. It doesn't say, why don't you fuck off? But it really does. <laughs> it really, really does say that. It really says, I don't believe a fucking word of it. And I'm quite happy to put it on a t-shirt. So that's what we, that's what we do. You can clap, you can clap, I'll pause. <laughs>
So that's that's what we do at Let Women Speak. The whole thing, like people go, why do you call it Let Women Speak? It's like we will do it. We're not asking for permission. No, we're not. We're saying we create a space to let women speak. We don't say, can we? Can you let women? We're not saying can you let women speak. We're saying we have done something to let women speak. I mean, could we? We could have called it allow women to speak. <laughs> but anyway what we do and most of the things that we do and most of the steps forward that we take at Let Women, Let Women Speak, which is born party of women, those things that we do are often totally inspired by the women that attend. Um, I have definitely added, stolen some of their best lines and put them into my own speeches and words. But that's what we do. That's why it's called Let Women Speak, because when we went to Nottingham, there were some very funny trans activists who kept shouting. I think it, the worst one was when a woman was talking about surviving rape. And then they started really shouting. And then some women in the group, our, our women, started saying, let women speak. And then that stuck as something. Because I think that is, that what make, that's what makes let women speak just a perfect kind of movement. Because it really is led by the women that attend a little bit by me uh, but it is really led by women that attend and we couldn't do anything without you uh, but I do need you to help support the things that I do so I can continue doing them okay this is the new Diamante um, by Casherelle um, okay if um, if you can put yourself forward because, my God, it's going to take so many of you. You're just going to have to do it. I don't want to hear why you should. I want to hear, you, I want to hear why you shouldn't. Like, any single one of you. Like, maybe you don't think you're good at public speaking. You will be. You just have to open your mouth and say it in a place where there are more people. That's all. It might be that you think that maybe your boss is going to get involved. But we are going to... Look, until we all do it, until we turn this tide... It's not going to turn on its own. So either you're part of the turning of the tide or you're going to get drowning in the undercurrent. But that's, that's kind of the... Oh, that was quite a good metaphor. <laughs> it's just... It just comes. It's natural. Um, I should, but it's, I think it's too long for a teacher. People would have to really stare at your breasts for a long time <laughs> to get the whole joke. Um, anyway, so... Uh, I can't remember where I was. I was, I was so impressed with myself. Um, so it really is going to be this. It's like, don't wait until it's safe. That's what all the academics are doing. And frankly, they're still doing it wrong. Uh, you can't wait till it's safe. You have to make it safe for others. And it's either going to be you or it's not. At the end of this war, which we will win by hook or by crook, you can either say, well, I was part of the charging. I was part of the frontline army. I did that, or you can say, I just, I had a very good view. It was, it was a very, very good view. Um, okay, so if you put yourselves forward for one of those things, if you keep speaking up one conversation at a time, then I promise we will win. Fingers on lips. <laughs> Are you yeah. Shut up, lad. Shut up. Um, <laughs> If you can just be brave, just speak the truth, do not be persuaded that compromise is, compromise is surrender, right? It really is. Compromise is capitulation. This is not a two thing war. This is, we had some nice shit and some blokes have come and stolen it and we'd like it back, thanks very much. And we don't want to lose another thing to those men. If you can... <laughs> If you can keep using that language without fear or hesitation, then I promise we will win. And do you know why else we're going to win? Why? Do you know? Do you know? <laughs> because I never lose. Turn it round, Mary. Oh, got one job. <laughs> oh. 
got to stay today.